event, Indigenous rights and women's leadership are central to divestment strategies. And I want to thank um, all of our amazing speakers for joining us today and to all of you who are with us. My name is Osprey Oriole Lake, and I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or WECAN. And we're very focused on the nexus of women's leadership and climate justice. And we're very honored to have curated this event today with our very close partner, Divest, Invest, Protect. And as we have our session today um, in our chat, um, Catherine Quaid, who's our amazing communications coordinator, will be putting different links so you can learn about the different organizations or the different causes that the women are going to be speaking about. So, you know, please um, go ahead and use the chat in a lively way. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to take a breath and acknowledge this moment. Um, we were just talking earlier how this is the autumn equinox and, you know, time just to, to take a pause and be in rhythm with Mother Earth and also to acknowledge the many losses of this year and the challenges that we are all facing. I'm, I'm here in California. Um, I'm sure you know we've been having a lot of fires and we're barely in fire season. Um, it's been very challenging. Uh, the COVID pandemic is still growing in um, globally um, in different regions in different ways. Uh, some of us are experiencing hurricanes, fires are blazing in the Amazon, and, and I could go on. Um, there's also been a lot of learning from this time. So challenging, but also lessons to be learned. And uh, the multiple crises at this moment are really exposing and amplifying systems of injustice and inequities from colonization to patriarchy, from racism to capitalism. And these systems of oppression disproportionately are harming indigenous peoples, black and brown communities, women, and also the land, Mother Earth herself. And one key part of changing these dangerous systems is challenging corporate actors like the fossil fuel industry and financial institutions and governments who are enabling the fossil fuel industry to continue to pollute while reaping massive benefits. As just one example, um, 33 banks have invested more than $1.9 trillion into the fossil fuel extraction since the Paris Climate Agreement. And I've seen even a report of this being quite a bit more. There was a recent report in March with even higher figures. So we need to be really clear that there's no way we can succeed in averting further climate catastrophe without first stopping fossil fuel expansion and the financing of it. And so today, along with many allies globally, we are continuing our call for divestment and for governments here in the United States to stop bailouts to the oil and gas sector under the guise of COVID-19 relief, when instead we need to be investing in people and planet and not polluting industries. I mean, it's been just really outrageous to, to see this. Um, and it's really important to remember also that even before the pandemic, the fossil fuel industry has been faltering with companies falling behind on loans and an overall glut in the market. And I, I think, you know, it's been really clear that, you know, this era of the fossil fuels is over. And it's also um, really vital to highlight that indigenous communities are disproportionately experiencing the impacts of the dual crises of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate chaos due to the ongoing colonial policies that we see. And this includes ongoing fossil fuel extraction and pipeline struggles in their territories. And you know, within this context, one of our highest priorities that we can is lifting up indigenous women's leadership. First, because we have so much to learn from their amazing traditional knowledge and spiritual wisdom, but also as we learn to truly address that we are living on stolen lands and we need to really um, learn how we are going to change this deep, deep dynamic that is hurting indigenous peoples and all of us. And we also need to recognize um, that there are gendered impacts to the exploitation of fossil fuel industry, because an example, indigenous women also face violations due to man camps coming into their territories with industry workers, which greatly increases cases of sexual violence and murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. But within this array of really difficult challenges, 
Indigenous women leaders are really showing us solutions. And together, we are fighting back with them. And right now, what I'd like to do is to share a short video with you that really features many of our speakers today so you can see them in action. So with that, Catherine, if you go ahead and share, share the video. Thank you. The decisions you make as Credit Suisse and the Swiss people affect those of us downstream from your actions. You sit here comfortably in your privilege while our communities bear the risks of your investments with our very health, our lives. We face a future without clean water as you reap your dividends and returns. What do you as Swiss people hold sacred? To us, water is life to all of us. I request that you uh, directly answer my questions now. Thank you. I will answer your question, as I said at the end, when everybody has spoken. And the next speaker is Monica Verdin. Thank I'm you. a shareholder, and I request that you answer our questions individually. Thank you very much. I'm the chairman who runs this AGM, and I decided I will answer at the end, which is my right, and uh, I have to live with it. Thank you. Here to let the investors know in the Kinder Morgan Pipeline expansion project how directly affected we are and how many times that we have opposed this project. We've been marginally ignored um, within that process, and the consultation that we had required has not been. Can you guarantee me and my nation that you will no longer have business relationships and provide finance for Kinder Morgan Company? We are here today to let Credit Suisse and all the other banks that are financing these projects that we have not given our consent, that we find water and clean air and land to be critical infrastructure, not pipelines. We're all citizens of this planet, and what happens in our homelands will affect the people here in Switzerland. For over a year and a half, we have tried to pursue all legal avenues possible, petitioning our state and federal agencies to conduct environmental impact studies, yet we have been unheard. And our resistance to this corporate colonialism that is tied to carbon extraction is growing, especially during these times where corporations are influencing our government to pass laws restricting our rights. What changes has Credit Suisse made to its due diligence and risk assessment processes following Dakota Access Pipeline? Investing in a company is just that, whether it's project level or corporate level financing. We need you to stop financing these dangerous companies. At two of the banks our delegation also met with, UBS and DNB, who we provided the same exact information to, chose not to renew their credit facilities with ETP. Yet Credit Suisse has taken no action and has made no statement. Not once in these calculations of profits is the loss of indigenous people's culture on this planet mentioned as a risk. Credit Suisse has a choice to do the right thing. So until then, indigenous peoples will continue to wage and escalate a mass globalization calling for accountability of Credit Suisse in the financial industry. We will call for divestment. We will call for a boycott. We will call for the sanction of Credit Suisse for these indigenous human rights violations by these oil companies that you are supporting by any and all means necessary. I ask that the Swiss people stand with us. I ask that you hold Credit Suisse accountable and say no. No, we will not fund these projects that are hurting people and committing human and indigenous rights abuses. Thank you. And 
it seemed like there's a little bit of a technical error. So we'll go ahead and put the video um, link into the chat section so you can also see more of the visuals. Um, but that was from one of our delegations, Indigenous Women Divestment Delegations, when we met with uh, Credit Suisse. So it gives you a sense of some of the work in action. So please let me go ahead and introduce our amazing presenters now. All of these women have served at various times on the councils of their tribal nations. And I think it's really important for financial institutions to recognize that they're speaking with leaders of sovereign nations when we have these meetings, especially as the women call for respect for indigenous rights as outlined in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and whether or not consent has been given or not for companies coming onto their lands. So um, the four speakers that we have today are Casey Camp Hornick of the Ponca Nation. She's the longtime native rights activist and environmental ambassador. And we're really honored that she is on our board at WeCamp and um, a dear friend and mentor. Charlene Alec from the Slave Left Truth Nation will be going next. She is a leader in her community and a Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion opponent and also has um, been one of our delegations and it's just really good to see her. Um, she's up in Canada and it's just really great uh, to connect um, online with her today. And then you'll be hearing from Monique Verdon of the Huma Nation. She's the director of the Land Memory Bank and Seed Exchange. She's an organizer with Another Vote as Possible and also has been on delegations with us and really excited to hear from her and updates from what's happening in the Gulf. And then we will be hearing from Michelle Cook, who's Dene from the Navajo Nation. She is a human rights attorney, the founder of Divest, Invest, Protect program, founder and co-director of the Indigenous Women's Divestment Delegations, which I'm also very honored to co-direct with her, which is um, a really big foundation of the work um, that, that is in the video that you saw and that we're working on together. So I first want to hand the floor to Casey. Um, she was on a a uh, divestment delegation with Deutsche Bank earlier this year with us um, and um, has been on the front lines of so many of these fossil fuel flights. Um, we specifically were talking about the financing of Keystone XL. Um, anyways, there's so much I know, Casey, you could share with us, but we'd love to hear from you and, and um, really, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Casey. It's an honor, Osprey. Uh, thank you to Osprey and WeCan for gathering this incredible group of uh, powerhouse women. Just listening to that uh, divestment hearing was so powerful. I'm, I'm fired up. I'm ready to jump in the streets and, and take them down, you know, right now. I, I love hearing uh, Monique as well. I remember in Paris when we spoke, and you're a young girl to me, and not feeling your voice being there, and there was that fire in your spirit. I remember the first time you spoke, it was very powerful, and you continue to grow in a beautiful way. I'm really proud of you. I want to uh, acknowledge this equinox right now. I want to acknowledge the spring and summer of 2020 as this incredible turning point that is happening within the universal flow and the purification of our mother earth as she decides how she wants to go forward and the rest of us are falling in line as we need to do i want to acknowledge the winds that blow that are part of this purification that are helping to clean and, and to purify in the manner in which they choose. I want to acknowledge the Thunder Nation and what it does through the hurricanes. I want to acknowledge the sacred fire and what it does in terms of, of purification and, and helping us to realign ourselves to the natural laws. I was watching a, a news feed about the fires in California and the weatherman was saying in shock, this fire is making its own weather. As if that was something new to them in science. 
in our traditional ways, we understand that human beings are just a tiny you know, grain of sand on the beaches in relationship to all of the natural forces that are enacting around our Mother Earth through her, above her, and helping her during this purification because human beings have burdened her uh, in her unconditional love and nurturing of us. We have failed to take care of her. When I see the young women like Charlene, who is uh, doing the, the, this on the ground work up there where she lives and we're downstream from her, but we're connected and we realize that we, we take that very seriously. It's not just words. I see the work that Michelle is doing and, and Osprey's doing, but we are just the uh, outward expression of our mother earth. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to also mention, as well as being an elected official and now an ambassador for my people, I'm an elder. I'm a drum keeper for the women's society of my people, the only one, the only woman's society that has survived. And this drum has been passed down to me through my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and through the forest removals and the ways that go with it. And it will belong to my daughters after this. And it is our honor and obligation to be here in what they call frontline activism, what we call being panka, being indigenous, being woman, being honored to serve in those capacities and being born as an indigenous woman gives us that, that sense of responsibility because without all of these sacred items being in place, and I mean the fire, the air, the water, the earth, those things that we eat, those things that we drink, the breath that we share, the relatives that are all around us and whatever life form they take, none of us would exist. And so it is incumbent on us to stand up and to create a path forward, just like our grandmothers and great grandmothers did for us. I want to acknowledge all of you who have tuned in from around the world. I'm astounded at this thing called uh, webinars and, and web things. I never had participated, you know, being the age that I am and my children, grandchildren, help me, you know, and organizations as well, help me to, to come in tune with this web. And I believe in my most sincere heart that uh, Creator is helping us in some ways to use this web as a web of life so that we are not out there in planes flying around. We're not driving our cars, but we're sitting within our homes, within the understanding of how we're supposed to live in balance and getting a little bit of taste of how do we grow our gardens? How do we look at ourselves in terms of teaching our children? I view this as a winter, um, season that we're approaching. In our winter season, traditionally, we gathered together in our lodges, in our earthen lodges, and families, multi-generational families came together. And we talked about what the next season would be, bring, what the last season taught us, what our great-great-grandparents said to us, what path do we have forward for the unborns that will be coming in our families and in the, in the buffalo and in the salmon and in all of those waters that lived around us as well and for the water herself. And we made these uh, fires in the center that were sacred fires that you, you, that you listened to and that you made your prayers to. We peeled the corn and, and she gave us her knowledge to 
the, the food that we ate, and on and on and on. And it feels like this time of COVID has also given us that opportunity as well, to gather in these families of humans, even though uh, today our tribe is in mourning because we've lost several that we weren't ready to let go of. Our traditional wisdom keepers are suffering uh, undue amounts. Our people live in a place that is so impacted by the fossil fuel industry that we've had to step out of our comfort zone, just as these other panelists have. Even though we can't sit four days with our relatives, we stay in mourning with them from a spiritual point of view. And we understand that even when they brought the smallpox blankets to us in the 1700s, the Ponca people understood how to take care of one another. And we, at that time, would remove ourselves from our village if we were sick and go someplace else to heal, sometimes together, but to protect the others. All of these lessons are lessons that we're trying to help others to understand. How are we supposed to treat one another as humans? How are humans supposed to treat what they call nature instead of understanding Standing, we are all nature protecting itself. We have to be able to enable ourselves to do the things that are being recognized as legal ways to go forward within our sovereignty as a Ponca people. We have passed our resolutions our, uh, that go into the Bureau of Indian Affairs, not to a federal level. Since they have abrogated every one of the five treaties we made them, we're going to say now we put a moratorium on fracking. Challenge us. Because we say no. Now we have enabled a statute, which is our law in our territory, that we're so blessed to caretake, polluted as it is, called the rights of nature recognizing the right of all living beings to exist. Now you challenge us because this is the law here. And we're encouraging through iron forms, uh, inner tribal rights of nature forms, other tribes to come into this kind of lawmaking that gives sovereignty even more teeth to fight back in the areas that we do. The Nez Pierce have uh, recently recognized the rights of the Snake River. Other tribes are looking at this, the Wanganui River being recognized by the Maori and that, that area. On and on we're beginning Monoman, the sacred uh, rice has been recognized with personhood. And why not? They can recognize corporations, the fools. They can go down their suicidal path. And we can recognize what is true power, what is the true rights of nature, and say that even the air that we breathe through your carbon trading, you're trying to sell the air we breathe like you have packaged water. These things have, have their own life their own life form that the great mystery put in place. It is not for you to buy or sell. You cannot call the sources of life your resource and then sell it. How do you hold your head up with honor when your generations to come look at you and they tell your stories and they will? Who will you be to them, those of you who call it resources. Those of you who buy and sell and invest in these dirty fossil fuels, those belong to our mother, the earth. The oil and gas itself is part of her life being. It is not for you to grab, snatch, suck, and kill and dirty the very air that your ancestors held sacred and our great, 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 great grandchildren will need. So we join together. We link in a sacred manner through our spirits 
and through the knowledge that is fed to us by the cellular memories, by the blood memories that we care, carry within ourselves, but also within this water that we drink every day. She's telling us something. Within the sacred food that we ingest, we're being told something as our cells fill. Within each breath that we take, that has been to all of my relatives in all directions, we learn. And we come to you with spoken voice, with our hearts and our spirits ready to link with you in this beautiful honor that we're given to say, divest now. Because if you continue on this path, you're only going to run into every roadblock that is already being set in place. And we honor the fire, air, the earth and the sacred water. And we learn and we pray and we go forward. Washkantanka, stand strong, Ankanaji, we stand together. Sha. Oh, thank you so much, Casey. Wow, thank you for those amazing words and your energy and power and leadership. It's just so, so important to all of us. Thank you very, very much. I really, really moved. And, um, you know, also just to highlight also you talking about rights of nature and Catherine, maybe you could put um, into the chat some links to, to our work around rights of nature, which is so important, which is, you know, taking us in the direction we need to go to recognize Mother Earth's rights, the natural laws of the earth that we need to live in balance with. While we do this work to divest, we also have solutions that we need to really be uplifting. And, um, you know, it's so true. We need to really, to end this use of, of quote unquote resources. Um, and just to say, you know, that the fossil fuel companies and their financiers are feeling the power of our divestment movement. We have to do so much more, so much more is needed in a short time. But, you know, this year we've seen some important divestment victories, such as the Atlantic Coastal Pipeline being fully canceled, as well as the tech mine in Canada. And as mentioned, you know, we met with um, Deutsche Bank, a delegation met with a delegation um, going to meet with Deutsche Bank online. I think it was our, our third time. And they announced a new fossil fuel policy that will immediately end all project level financing for new tar sands and Arctic oil projects. So this is some really good news that we're hearing after you know lots of people with indigenous leadership and, and many groups pushing on these banks and we need much more from them um, and much more from different financial institutions but we also need to recognize that there has been some shifts this year and we need them to continue. So thank you so much Casey for your words and now um, I'd like to turn to Charlene Alec and, and hear from you up in so-called Canada and um, really appreciate you joining us today and for you know being a part of our delegations and your incredible leadership. Thank you, Charlene. Hey Charlene, you're muted. Sorry. Simtalat Quenat Squi, Talitsan At Slewat Ot E Stalo Tamas, Heit Sapka Wikam, and thank you, United Nations Climate Forum, for having us here. Thank you for having me. I'm Charlene Alec. I am descendant from Chiam and Slewatith Nation. I reside at Slewatith, also known as Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Slewatith are people of the inlet and we have lived on the land and water surrounding the Burrard Inlet since time out of mind. It is here that Slewat's first grandmother was created from the sediment that lies at the bottom of the deep fjord, thus giving Slewat people a sacred trust and an inherent responsibility to care for and steward our territory. It is something that we are born knowing and are willing to bear as it is both our joy and our privilege to carry this obligation. One that compels us to restore and protect this land 
from further degradation, but also to use both our voices and our bodies to defend it from the brutal industrial development that takes no notice of either us or our sacred inlet. Today, you might come to my land and think that it's beautiful, or you might take in the view down the inlet and think that there's already so much industry here that more cannot matter at all. Our inlet, after all, now sees 25 times the amount of industrial discharge that it saw five years, 50 years ago. But for me and my people, the views are very, very different. What we see how it once was before the pollution and the spoils of power, before the pipelines, tankers and oil slicks, we see back to the day when my grandfather would say, when the tide goes out, the table is set. We see back to the days through a deep knowledge of place that has been painstakingly cataloged by the stories and memories of countless elders and ancestors over thousands of years. This unceded sacred land. Today, we find ourselves in a David versus Goliath battle with the government of Canada, a government that on one hand promises reconciliation and on the other tells us that we only have rights if it is something that they deem is our right. In 2018, Canada purchased the Trans Mountain Canada uh, Trans, Trans Mountain Pipeline Tanker and Expansion Project from Kinder Morgan. This is a pipeline that will increase the amount of diluted bitumen coming from Alberta tar sands sevenfold and increase the Aframat class tankers traversing and docking in our inlet from approximately five tankers a month to 34. We are not a nation of no, and we've studied this project carefully. We commissioned reports and we looked at all of the benefits as well as all of the problems. But it could not pass our stewardship policy and we could not therefore give our free and prior informed consent for it to be built. And yet it is. We said no, but like so many ill-conceived projects, our right to speak out for our land and the safety of not only our people, but all people, only extend it to a place where they claimed to hear us and then claimed that in the end, they knew better. How could they know better? And so we went to court once and again and again and again, and so here we are. On September 15th, the United Nations released a report that said that globally we have failed to meet a single target to stem the destruction of wildlife and life-sustaining ecosystems and in the last decade, and that more public money is being invested in things that harm biodiversity than things that support biodiversity. Somehow, governments which are filled with smart, often well-meaning people are failing. This doesn't just doesn't seem, they just don't seem to understand the scale of the challenge, or maybe they live in a world of magical thinking where eventually everything will either get better or go away if they ignore it long enough. How can that be? How can this be left to a handful of exhausted citizens and brave outspoken youth and to us? How could it be that all of the people with the ability, the intelligence and the capital and power can leave this to the protection of the very thing that sustains them to us. When we met with the government of Canada, we shared our concerns, concerns that have caused such pain and fear in our, in our nations. We fear for the future, but even more, we fear for the present. Already juvenile herring are dying from the effects of impact pile driving. The seals and the orcas that are drawn into the inlet by the herring are regularly spotted by the work site and there is ineffective monitoring to protect them. And this is only the beginning. This is only now the building of the infrastructure. What happens when 34 tankers bulging with bitumen traverse the inlet every month? What they call normal spillage is enough to poison our waters forever, let alone, God forbid, there should ever be a spill. What if this pipe, what this pipeline brings to my nation is not oil, but rather it brings the, the, the destruction of habitat, the extinction of plants and animals, and the loss of biodiversity. It also brings a far greater risk around climate. While the pipeline itself does not create a lot of missions, more pipeline infrastructure will. 
by necessity led to continued expansion of the fossil fuel economy. It seems obvious to us that the risk far outweighs the reward for this project. Yes, there are profits to be made. Yes, there are jobs to be had, but why not take a step back and look how else we might solve these problems? Are we lacking in imagination that destroying our environment is our only way to prosper? I'm very proud of my nation and our decision to do whatever we could to stop this project. It has taken a major toll on us and has taken so much capital and time that we will never see again. However, it is after all our sacred trust and in the end, this has fallen to us. In the courts, we have had some wins and some losses. In communities along the pipeline route, we raised awareness and gained many friends and allies. We met investors on Wall Street and spoke to rating companies we approached insurance corporations and met with bankers in Switzerland. Three different insurance companies decided not to renew with Trans Mountain this year, including their main insurer, Zurich. These companies pulled out because of climate risk. This is the direct result of those few exhausted citizens and a number of First Nations working to have our voices heard. We shared with them our work that spurs the hope for the future. Through our partnerships with local groups, we have restored fish bearing streams, relocated out to our territory, and we have witnessed an ecosystem flourish. An isolated clam bed was cleaned and restored, and just a few years ago, harvested for the first time in 60 years. As well, last year, we saw the first herring spawn in 130 years. This year has seen pandemics and fires, epic storms, and just this week, the sad passing of the notorious RBG. As I reflect on her passing, I'm reminded that she always believed that we should fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. I feel our allies and our friends grow every day. And I believe that it is because we are like she was on the right side of history. We are at a pivotal moment in our lives to make better choices and to be better humans. The earth is screaming for us to do better. I'm also reflecting on the recent loss of my own mother. In her life path, she suffered greatly from the effects of residential school. She had many obstacles, but she powered through it. And in the hardest of times, she upheld our traditions, our culture with the greatest amount of love. If I can share one thing from her, it is to let love win. Once we love, we hold it high, we keep it dear, we understand it better and we protect it more. Most of all, we would not let what we love be destroyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene, and um, really, really moved by all of your work and incredible dedication and the strength of your nation in your fight with the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And um, I know it's been, as you said, you know, some some victories and some losses, and you know, just wanted to lift up, you know, these these wins with the insurance companies. You know, now that you know the the pipelines owned by the government, some of those original divestment strategies with asset managers and bankers really needed to shift. But that opening with the insurance companies is still there. And for, for those of you listening in, you know, you can't build a pipeline or do um, any kind of extraction if you don't have uh, underwriting from insurance companies. So these wins with the insurance companies are huge. And I really want to acknowledge the the powerful advocacy led by indigenous leaders and there's been a lot of campaign pressure engagement by a lot of environmental groups to to really push that through and that win with Zurich was very big and right now you know there's another push with um, Liberty Mutual which is another big insurer of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and we'll put a link in the chat about how to get involved in supporting um, demanding that Liberty Mutual also remove themselves from the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So we're trying to pull away all of those insurers to support uh, the Slave Watooth Nation. And thank you again, Charlene Alec, for your very, very deep and powerful words and presentation. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll hear from Monique Verdon. Um, um, 
just really excited to hear from you. And I wonder if you can talk to us about, you know, your community. I mean, you're right there in Cancer Alley. Um, you're in the Gulf. What is happening there? Is there's just so much to face for you and your community with the, the oil refineries, um, pipeline pollution, and related health issues. Then you've got you know these hurricanes, um, you know nonstop um, from climate chaos. Um, you know, thank you so much for for taking time with us today in the middle of of you dodging yourself a lot of, of storms. So we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Monique. Thank you, Osprey. Um, yeah, uh, as Osprey said, um, my name is Monique Verdan and I'm a member of the Homa Nation. I also work with a collaborative um, of folks across the Gulf South from Brownsville, Texas to Pensacola, Florida um, with another Gulf as possible. And we're working for just ecologies, economies, and, um, and really trying to find solutions um, to how we adapt to all of these challenges we're up against. And I'm honored to be um, in such fierce, sweet, wise, strong, and loving company. Um, I've been really emotional on the call all day and um, you know, thinking back to Paris, as um, Casey mentioned, that was a real moment in my life where I was at a weekend event and we were just covering it, doing media for the Indigenous Environmental Network. And I kept hearing these stories from women all over the world that sounded so similar to the story that I knew, but I also felt like because South Louisiana, where I come from, has been a place where you know oil and gas was tapped early on and infrastructure and industry really grabbed hold of the Mississippi River Delta and just kept thinking like, oh, we are a really good, bad example to let all of these women know to keep fighting the good fight because corporate and colonial interest um, have side effects that are toxic. And, um, you know, I'm right now on the crystal quartz shores of a barrier island in the traditional territories of the Pensacola uh, along Florida's Northwest Panhandle. They were hit by Hurricane Sally, which was an unexpected one of these storms just kind of popped up in the Gulf and just drenched, um, you know, like 30 inches of rain fell here last week. And just to say right now, there's a, another tropical system that's going in at Houston, which we all know is like one of the most industrialized um, places in the world and they flood. Um, so just sending, um, yeah, thoughts and love to them today. And that storm is going to keep moving. And we know that these storms are tied to the climate crisis, that the ocean is the ultimate regulator and she's hot and um, we're feeling those effects. But my home um, is, you know, I've been here in Pensacola helping do relief work and um, but my home is, is, is uh, you know, just I say sometimes that I live north of the dead zone where all of this fertilizer, petrochemical fertilizer runoff is killing the oxygen, at, you know, the mouth of the Mississippi River. Um, and I am, I'm, I, and my home is in Cancer Alley in the southern part. So Cancer Alley is about 100 miles or more um, where there are almost 200 uh, petrochemical facilities that line the banks of, of the Mississippi River, which is draining 41% of the United States and three Canadian provinces, I think. Um, you know, so there's a lot of water that's coming through. And um, we have some of the worst air quality in the nation due to uh, these refineries, multinational corporations, Valero and PBF, where there are sulfur dioxide emissions. Um, the Shakta called this territory Balancha, which means place where many languages are spoken, because this has been a place of trade long before the colonizers came in and rebranded, um, you know, our homelands, Louisiana, and the port city of New Orleans, which was the sacred grounds of, of, of not just the Homan nation, but this place being home to the Biloxi, the Shiramacha, the Shakta, the Atakapa Ishak, the Shapatulis, the Bayugula, the Washa, Shawasha, the Akola Pisa, and so many other nations who have been forgotten or their names never recorded before histories erased their hist before history, their histories were erased by colonial conquest and 
and corporate interest. Um, you know, we had early contact. It was the late 1600s when these French explorers came in. Um, the company of John Law, John Law's Company of the West Indies, right? Like that was what was funneling uh, this kind of in investment in this new new world. Um, and and we know where petro or where petrochemical plants now sit is where plantations were. And so to remind folks that you know we are. Um, in the cycle of being told you have um, cotton or sugarcane, or you have oil and gas, or you have nothing, and the powers that be playing um, <clears throat> with the politics. And especially now, as we see, you know, the uh, United States administration uh, rolling back on regulations. I can smell it when I pass the refineries. And, um, and we know that also as oil and gas is on the decline, they're double downing on single use plastics. And so as we're having this fracking boom that's happening all over the country, Louisiana, which used to be pushing out oil and gas to the rest of the nation. I mean, we are, um, you know, we have 17 of the oldest and biggest refineries in the nation. Um, so, you know, it's uh, also 50,000 miles of pipelines have been dredged through Louisiana and most of those being in our, our estuaries and in our wetlands, which I say, you know, yeah, I live north of the dead zone and south of Cancer Alley, but also I know that the Delta is a power point for the planet where water comes to be purified, connecting to the rest of the ocean systems of the world. Um, and we're losing land at one of the fastest rates on the planet here. So the side effects of, um, of double downing on dirty fossil fuels is long, uh, is long lasting. And we're up against like not knowing what our futures may look like. And at this moment, you know, I even myself, I've been moving my boxes from here to there for the feels like weeks now. Um, and knowing that hurricane season this year is like no other, but also knowing that this is the new reality, that this is the climate crisis that we've all been saying, hey, this is, you know, on the horizon, here it is. And, and just want to kind of circle back to what I was saying about the, the, the industry double downing on single use plastics. We just had a major um, spill of nurdles, which are these little tiny, it sounds like really cute, but it's not. It's these little tiny plastic pellets, um, which they're, you know, shipping in all of this fracked gas, creating these single use pellets, and then they ship them all over the world. And just, um, a month ago, uh, there was a major spill of these nurdles. So millions, if not billions of these little tiny pellets just went out into the Mississippi River and the Coast Guard was like, oh no, we're not responsible for that cleanup because it's considered hazardous waste. So actually nothing has been done and there is no accountability. So just seeing these connections of like what's being fracked in North Dakota, not only is it being shipped across the United States, crossing, you know, thousands of, of waterways. I mean, the Bayou bridge which is the last leg of the Dakota access goes through you know crosses 700 of our waterways just here in Louisiana so I think that you know um, recognizing our we're we're all connected what happens in Charlene's community what happens in Casey's community what's happening in Michelle's community um, is happening to my community and so um, you know, I, 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 sometimes it's like, what are we, you know, we're like up against so much, but I find such um, strength and was just thinking, I'm so grateful to know that there are such strong women out there fighting and winning. Um, they may be small wins sometimes, but um, the faith that we deserve better and um, how, you know, water is what we all must protect because it is um, responsible for everything, just as Charlene's story and, you know, her, her family, you know, we also believe that um, our origins are from the ocean, that the crawfish built the land that we now stand upon. And uh, thinking of ourselves as, as, you know, the ancient mound builders, it makes a lot of sense too. So the water um, is the land. Uh, and it, so, yeah, I am um, grateful. Um, for all of you and all of the work that you're doing. And thank you for the time. Mm, thank you so much, Monique. And know that we're thinking of you as you are moving about and 
doing everything you can to protect your community. And, um, you know, it just shows, I remember you once telling me how you feel like a lot of the women you're working with, they're like rising up out of the mud of the land. And I always see that image and, you know, facing so much pollution and destruction to your land. It, it, it really moves my heart, brings tears to my eyes too. when, when you speak of it, um, so thank you for, for sharing your story. And, you know, I just, you know, have to say that we must have justice and accountability from the people who are doing this, from the extractive industries and their financiers. And that's why we're so dedicated to this divestment work because all of this is going on because people are making decisions. This isn't just happening. You know, the world is ready to move off of fossil fuels. There are regenerative renewable energy sources. We don't need to keep pumping up these dying industries of the fossil fuel sector that were already dying before the pandemic started. Uh, there's been a glut to the point where there are uh, tankers. If people live by the coast, you'll see oil tankers out there holding the oil because there was no place to put it. And it, it just needs to stop. We need to get off of this fossil fuel industry, this fossil fuel economy, and respecting indigenous people's rights is one of the most important ways to do that. I just wanted to also mention um, an updated fact from something I said earlier, which is there's actually 35 global banks that have provided $2.7 trillion in financing to the fossil fuel companies since the Paris Climate Agreement. So we're not doing well at all. We have so much more to go. And with that, I wanted to uh, bring Michelle Cook into the conversation. And also, I know Casey Camp Hornick, who I love and adore, and we're so glad you have you here. I know that she also has another engagement. So at any point, Casey, that you need to jump, we understand and we deeply, deeply thank you for your words. Um, and, and thank you for joining us today. Please stay as long as you can. Michelle Cook and I have quite a history. I'm thrilled that you're on this call today. We met at Standing Rock. Um, and it feels feels like um, you know Mother Earth put us together for a reason, and um, I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you for your analysis and wisdom, and please take the floor. Thank you, Michelle. Well, yeah, it's a Michelle Cook in the share. Hanalah ni nishlin bilagana basis chin to bahi dash a bilagana dash nali. Hello, my name is Michelle Cook. I'm born of the one who walks around you clan of the Dene Nation. And this is how I identify myself as a Dene woman. Um, my name is Michelle Cook, and I am the founder of Divest Invest Protect, as well as the co-director of the Indigenous Women's Divestment Delegations. And I'm so thankful to be here with um, some of the women who have been in our cohort. Um, we've had an incredible four years of engagement with the financial industry, and I believe that we are setting a pace for the planet right now. And we will see if the financial industry can keep up with indigenous women. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. I see so many people from all over the world um, tuned in here today. And I'm so thankful to see you all. Um, you know, I'm gonna address a couple things today because this is um, a UN event. There is a caution, I want to issue a word of caution because what I don't think is a solution is finan the financialization of nature. What I don't think is the solution is, is thinking that somehow capitalism or money is going to solve this issue, right? We, the purpose, climate change presents us with a problem, right? It doesn't say, throw more money onto the problem, right? And I feel like, and what I read from the United Nations very often with sustainable development is this idea that somehow we're going to buy our way out of this. Somehow we're gonna buy ourselves some more time. And I believe that is woefully mistaken. And I encourage our people, real people, to come up with real solutions that are going to work for us. Um, it's not an opportunity to sell carbon credits. It's not an opportunity to make indigenous people's banks, right? 
that that's not the point of all the work that we're doing at least not the point of the work that i'm doing the point of the work of divest invest protect is to decolonize this economy to decolonize institutions like the united nations the united nations still doesn't have a seat at the table for indigenous peoples yet so how can we look to them to protect us completely when we still aren't recognized for what we are as original nations original nations we have just as much right if not more as any of these nation states that have been created but yet we're still regulated um, to a position that is less than who we are and so that needs to change at the united nations as well um, you know we can't drink money we can't drink oil and we can't eat money and that and that is the truth we have to connect back to the land we have to connect back to seed and to water and those simple things are is what will save us are is what will bring us forward but we're not going to do that if we don't decolonize and still in this you know conversation in, in this discourse we have yet to see from my opinion from any institution a historical understanding of capitalism right what we're given is always assuming that capitalism is the end result of human civilization right we we need to question the fiat itself we need to question the bureaucracy itself we as indigenous peoples we have the right to form our own economies economic rights as indigenous peoples that is we don't even have to use the currency of the nation state if we didn't want to because we are nations we are nations so we can choose with our minds with our intent we can manifest the world that we want but we have to envision it we have to know that it can be real we have to know who we are and who we are as indigenous peoples, we lived on this land with our economies, matrilineal economies, for millennial without burning this place to cinders. And that's where we are now. The sky is red. And they say that we still have to wait. There's no time to wait. Time is not neutral. Time is a privilege and indigenous peoples don't have that time. So everyone at the UN, if you're UN people listening right now, keep up with us, keep up with us for your own good. Move with us. We need that. We need that from you as UN bureaucrats, as UN people, we need indigenous peoples to be at the table at the beginning not invited after the fact, not invited as mere stakeholders or civil society organizations. We need indigenous peoples to be at the table at the concept stage, proposing solutions to climate change at the UN level. That's equality. That is how we practice decolonization in reality, not just as a metaphor. And again, when we talk about climate change, we cannot solve this issue if we are not making corporations who are doing the damage accountable show me you win show me where corporations who are doing this are being held accountable on this earth where is justice for our people on this earth and we look for it everywhere we go to europe and look for it we go to the un and look for it we go to our congress we go to our parliaments our legislators we go everywhere we can as indigenous peoples as indigenous women to protect our nations and our futures and so we're still looking for that justice and it's not here what we have so far is a proposed binding treaty on transnational and, inter and, and transnational corporations that is yet to be that is yet to be finalized and that that's as far as the un has really gotten in many respects so we have this void of accountability and part of part of that void is the actual 
creation of the corporation and organization itself, right? You create a corporation and an organization so that you can limit your liability. So the whole point of creating that legal structure is so that you can create, you can have that distance to hold, to not be accountable. Indigenous peoples, we have to pierce that corporate veil completely. And we have to under, have a historic understanding of capitalism as, as it relates to natural resource extraction and how it, this financialization of, of climate change is a continuation of colonization. Um, you know, in addition to that, psychologically, there has to be a lot of questioning here on who we are and how we relate to the world around us. If you see yourself as a consumer and the world as a resource, then you then that is, that's the relationship you will have to it. But if you see yourself in a relationship different to it, in harmony with it, then you're gonna be able to protect it. You're gonna be able to see the paradigm. So there has to be this paradigm shift, this structural paradigm shift in how we relate to ourselves and the earth as well. Um, you know, and, and for indigenous peoples, you know, we were never exiled from the Garden of Eden. You know, we were never exiled. We were never taught that this earth was something for us to dominate. You know, we, we were not subject to an angry male God, right? So there's so many impositions um, that, have, that have contributed to this issue of climate change. Um, and so I encourage us to not only look for solutions, but to look back to the past. So what I have here and what maybe some of you all don't know in the, rest of, in the rest of the world is that these little shells are called wampum, wampum. And these were the original economic structure and legal structure of the United States of America. And this is how Indian people in the Northeast here manage their, their people and their economies. So we need to understand what these pre-colonial economic systems are so that we can envision what the future can be. Um, and I know indigenous people's traditional knowledge is, is part and parcel of that solution. And so I'm thankful to be here with all of these incredible women. And finally, I think any solution that is proposed regarding climate change, if it doesn't include indigenous self-determination, true self-determination for our peoples to be independent self-determined nations, um, it's not a complete solution. But thank you all so much for being here. Um, let us know if you need any additional resources. We're, we're excited to partner um, with organizations all around the world. So if this is work you're interested in, get in contact with us. We want to build our networks. We want to support one another and learn from one another. Um, so let's continue to build these relationships. And thank you all so much for turning in. Um, also, if you can support financially, invest financially in these women, in each one of their organizations and the work that they do, um, because it's not, it's difficult and we're surviving too. So invest in indigenous peoples, invest in indigenous human rights defenders as, as a solution to climate change. And again, thank you so much to WeCan and for all of our delegates for being here and for all of you all uh, for tuning in today too. Thank you. Ah, thank you so much, Michelle, for your, your great words of wisdom and information. And I just wanted to, um, you know, really highlight one of the reasons we're sharing a lot of information in the chat and we'll follow up with um, a document afterwards is so that you can uh, contribute to all of these women in the work that they're doing and to follow them and to learn more. And, you know, for everyone, I think it's so important, as you can see from hearing from these amazing women, that if you don't know the indigenous peoples where you live, find out whose territories are you on? Whose stolen lands do you live on? And learn who they are, what their struggles are, what their needs are. Because as you can see from the knowledge that we've heard, the traditional ecological knowledge, the spiritual wisdom, the guidance 
of the original people of the lands where we live. This is where we're going to find our solutions. This long time knowledge of living close at the land and living in a different worldview is so important to all of us. And so I really encourage you to reach out to Indigenous peoples where you live and support them to support all of these women. And again, we're sharing a lot of links so that you can do that. And to remind everyone that 80%, 80% of all the biodiversity, all the water, all the forests, all the clean biodiversity that still exists on this planet is in the territories and lands managed by Indigenous peoples. So if we're not standing up for Indigenous rights or ensuring that they have a front seat at the table, we're really not doing our job if we really are fighting for our future generations on this planet. This is a time to listen to Indigenous peoples and I would say Indigenous women. If I had my way, uh, I would want all the leadership, really quite frankly, on Turtle Island to, to go to Indigenous women and all of the Americas. Can you imagine a future if these women were leading our countries with their nations and knowledge? Um, I know that Casey, you've got to jump. So I wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to have a last word. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. I just wanted to be respectful of your schedule, but um, we could take some uh, questions in the chat, but, but let me hand the floor to Casey because I, I know she has some timing to deal with today. Thank you. I will have to leave soon for another webinar on the rights of nature with other indigenous people and, and movement rights is hosting that. Um, there's so much wisdom that was just shared from each one of these young ladies. And each one of them is a, is a way forward into uh, the next phase of being, which is realigning human law with natural law. And I really want to encourage the United Nations people to take into consideration not only what you've heard today, which is only common sense, but also what you're feeling today about what you're hearing. My mama used to tell me, truth has a power of its own. And we're speaking the truth to you because every human has a right to the simple things that all humans were part of in the very beginning of this journey on our mother earth. And that is to be born into a loving place where we love one another, care for one another, take care of one another. And that means all living beings and all beings are living. So together let's make this a place. When we say United Nations, are we limiting ourselves to saying humans are superior to all other things when in fact we are part of all living things? Let's expand these spirits, these emotions, and these minds that the Creator has put in place to include a future for all of those things that we love and all the ways that we go forward. And I would encourage us to do as uh, these young ladies have said. We set the way forward, we women folks. Within our structure, even though in, in the Ponca way, my brothers, my companion, my sons would speak for me had I had a ceremony or something I wanted to say, I would be the one standing there telling them what I once said. I am the person in charge of what happens within my household. And my home is with my mother, the earth. Let's do it, ladies. Men folks, we're gonna hold you up. You've had a heavy burden in this patriarchal society. Let's rebalance on this equinox. Thank you all, and I love you all. Shan. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your beautiful words and spirit. Thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and open up uh, the floor and the chat for, for questions. If uh, we can maybe take a few before we sign off here, we've just got about 15 minutes left or so. And um, I wanted to mention since um, some of you might not know and uh, both Michelle and 
Casey mentioned it, that this event is happening during Climate Week, as some of you might know. A lot of us would be gathering normally in New York City during Climate Week, which runs parallel to the United Nations General Assembly. They're in session now. And so this is part of um, you know, civil society events that often run during that period of time since uh, the nations are gathering online this year. And um, so this divestment event is really to create our own civil society intervention into that conversation. So I wanted just to have folks understand why we're, we are also bringing in the United Nations into this conversation as countries meet. Um, so um, I'm looking into the chat for any uh, questions. In the meantime, while we're doing that, um, we have a question here. Um, to what extent does the word equity, oops, it moved, equity do justice in centering the perspectives of those at the front lines of climate change? If one of you would like to take that on, to what extent does the word equity do justice in centering the perspective of those on the front lines of climate change? Would any of you like to respond to that? Or, you know, if uh, you can work with the question and also maybe just make some, some comments, maybe some closing comments here as well. Michelle, do you wanna jump in on that? Um, sure, I, you know, I think we're always a bit limited with the English language, um, but I do think equity is important, an important word. Um, I know that there's people who don't necessarily agree with it, the word equality, uh, because as Indigenous peoples, we, um, while we all have human rights, all of our rights are a bit different in order to fully enjoy them. So for Indigenous peoples, um, to be equal is not just to, you know, be able to vote in the U.S. elections. To be, to have equity is that we're able to vote in our own tribal elections and elect our own, own officials to govern our people and our lands. Um, so I think that there's a lot of equity, I believe, that needs to happen across the board. Um, and, and, and not completely even equity, because as Indigenous peoples, as the first um, original nations of the land, um, our sovereignty within our land should be supreme. Um, and we should be able to rule by our law and govern by our law within our territories as we have uh, for millennia. Um, and, and at least that's how I uh, see some of the um, um, uh, definitions that uh, I've seen. And, and another question I see is the definition of indigenous peoples among climate circles. Um, I think, you know, one, there is no definition of indigenous peoples that's been agreed all upon, but the UN uh, defines that as a group of people who have cultural, linguistic, uh, legal, government um, defined uh, territories, um, language, etc. Um, so some of some of those uh, concepts have been defined at the uh, UN. And then I don't know if anyone else would like to um, look at these other two Okay, great. Thank you, Michelle. And I just wanted to 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 jump in there with a question uh, about you know um, we are at you know in our organization and much of this work that we're doing around climate justice is definitely um, you know women, femmes, queer, trans, two spirit are all welcome. All of us together. You know we we don't. Um, we are inclusive of everyone. So I just wanted to make that really clear for the person who asked that question around divestment, decolonization. Um, you know, we, we work with, with all folks, all of our kin. We are all family. We are all together in this. So I just wanted to make that really clear. Um, and I think, you know, because we're, we're running out of time here, just to maybe hand the floor back to Monique first and then Charlene, just to make some closing comments um, and uh, anything you want to comment from the questions or anything else you'd like to say before we, we close our session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Osprey. Um, yeah, I just, you know, there's a question here. How do you ensure that monies and work donated to nations fighting the climate crisis actually go to their community members and behind the scenes frontline peoples? 
Um, and I just want to uh, to to say that you know, Michelle's right about the money is not going to solve our problems. The money is actually our problem, or the way that whole system works. Um, but also at the same time, recognizing that we live in this system, um, and so you know, I think that. Um, and, and what does, you know, it's always like when you're writing a grant, like, oh, are the deliverables real? You know, and I think that this kind of like long-term relationship building um, and long-term investment, whether that means money or that means support, connections, community, networks um, that are sharing information and sharing solutions. And I also think that, you know, in places like South Louisiana, the industry says you have oil and gas, you have nothing. I think that what we or me, I can just speak for myself. I passed by refineries, I passed by pipelines all my life, but I, it was like, a couple of years ago where I was like, oh, government, corporations, their relationships, their networks, these banks that are like way across on the other side of the world are fueling this destruction in my backyard. And so I think that, you know, what we really need is investment in solutions. Um, and what we really need is for folks to be able to share um, information and that um, our true liberation will come from having sovereignty and, and you know in my, my sense right now I'm like oh we need water like water sovereignty that right now in this climate crisis that we're in where everybody's like oh can I get some bottled water because this is not good like my water coming out of the tap is not good right so so what what are our values and and what are our resources and how do we share them in sustainable and regenerative ways um, I think that that's something um, frontline climate folks really really need support with thank you so much for that and uh, Monique that's really powerful and and again, um, people, while you were speaking, were wondering, you know, how you get, you know, funding to frontline folks. And I think it's a lot through uh, reaching out to people like Monique and Charlene and others and Michelle who are on the front lines and through their organizations, through indigenous organizations, uh, frontline groups are all over uh, promoting and sharing their work on social media channels. Um, and going to those trusted sources and they know what to do with their own funding and to directly fund them is I think a, a good way to go forward. And I know Charlene, you had your hand up and I wanted to hand the floor back over to Charlene. Thank you, Osprey. Yeah, I just wanted to um, share with a view of the earlier question that Michelle had answered, um, which I totally 100% agree with her. It's really hard sometimes um, coming from that onset of uh, making decisions, living life, um, governing um, what we do, what we say, and how we run our day-to-day -day businesses from an Indigenous mindset and incorporating it into the Western um, society and finding words of um, the actions that we do and incorporating it into the English language. Um, one thing that we live by, or one of our great mottos is not samat. One heart, one mind, one prayer. We have one planet. It's not um, gender bias, it's not religious bias, it's not um, racial bias. It's everybody's job to work together with one heart, one mind and one prayer for the earth. Um, for our mother. And I like how eloquently Casey had said, you know, we band together, we come together, we hold our men high, they've got jobs to do that look after the woman that look after the earth. Um, each of us is placed on earth with a purpose and a gift. And once we find that it's our responsibility to share with one another. That's the equity building. You see a gift in somebody, you build it up. You see a woman struggling, you, you help her out, find her gift so that it can be shared amongst everyone. Same with children, elders, men, uh, youth, teenagers. We are all in this together and that's um, not so much. We, um, we, we go from um, 
building each other up to, to sharing it. And um, you don't be uh, took, you don't be stingy with your gift. You travel it, you share it, and you bring it around and and um, do that where you can. Also, the emergency. I, I don't can't remember if it was a question that I saw in the chat about how do you elevate. Um, how do you elevate if something is happening in your territory and um, you know that it's going to be destructive, you know that it, there's going to be irreparable damage to the ecosystem's environment, to people and to the land. Um, we once uh, long ago would have a wolf runner, we used to call them, and that's where you see something that they would deliver messages. But if you see an emergency, it is that responsibility of the wolf runner to elevate that to in an emergency state, not just news shared between, hey, Monique, this happened to me today. Guess what, Os Osprey? I'm going to go out on the water. But to elevate it to an emergency status. Um, and if, you, you know, United Nations, are hearing this, that um, who's on the front lines, who's on the land, who's taking care of the water and monitoring, um, and that knows these types of emergencies um, is the Indigenous people. And we know how to elevate it to a stance where, okay, that's enough is enough. We need to look after our water. We need to look after the salt water, the tributaries of, of the rivers, all the water basins that form um, all our connectedness and you know the food that we take from it needs to be taken care of and if there is no elevation then it's like oh well they're there anyway or it's happening anyway. Um, what are we to do? Once you elevate that emergency and then you collect and make friends and allies to help you see the emergency that it is. Um, and that is that is one of the things Lewitoth has done. We've shared the knowledge of the risk that we're being asked to bear from, you know, we're well within the, the first ring of danger. If God forsake there was a fire over there, um, we were told by the fire chief that they would not be able to handle a fire um, at the dock or at the holding tanks. And how do we, how do we pursue that as an emergency? How do we tell the world, um, tell these corporations, tell our government um, is by doing this, sharing that risk so that people know, um, you know, what our options are. Um, I see a lot of strengths and, um, friendship happening in the chat here of what what can you do we do have a website we do have Facebook Twitter all those uh, social medias to keep us connected in that way to share the work that has been done but also what needs to be done and how you can participate um, how you can be not so much so I see a lot of good-hearted people and a good good comments um, and the good work you know, with everybody on the panel here of, of sharing that good work in your respective territory. Um, not so much. Mm, thank you. That's so beautiful, Charlene. And we are sharing your information about your tribal uh, website as you're speaking, just so you know, as we have with, with all of the speakers, as mentioned, so we can all stay connected. Um, and uh, we are coming to the, the close of our session. I really want to thank all the participants who's joined us today and listened in, and especially to our amazing speakers and the struggles and solutions that you're offering. And, um, you know, just to mention that the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, you know, um, we are deeply committed to those on the front lines. We are deeply committed to Indigenous women, Black women, Latinx women, a lot of women of color who are fighting around the world. And we need systemic change. We need systemic change. The systems we're in are not working as we can all see between the climate crisis, the pandemic, um, gender inequality, the economic crisis. I mean, we are in a major transformation and we've only been able to address a very small part of so many things we could discuss. I think we could probably all be on this call for four days to unpack so much of what has been said. Um, but you know, I hope everyone has learned a lot 
I have just, you know, so much respect for everything that has been shared today. And I, I would just love people to, you know, continue to support all of these women and to understand that we are in a major transformation. This is a call um, from Mother Earth at the deepest, deepest level. And we need to meet that call. And, you know, we are in great transformation internally in our organizations, in our lives, in everything that we're doing. And that's what's being demanded of us, that we give everything, everything's on the line for us to really show up, uh, give our all. This is not a time for business as usual, and it's not a time to be conservative, and it's not a time for incremental change. And so, um, you know, I kind of want to bring us back to the top end of the of, of the session where we showed you that really powerful time of us going to meet with Credit Suisse and hearing these women really calling out the corporate leaders because we are challenging corporate power. On the one hand, we need to really assert our power and assert our authority and support indigenous sovereignty and support climate justice. And on the other hand, we need healing and we need to build the solutions on the ground and we need these new economic frameworks that were shared today and many others. Um, this economic system must come down. So we need an end to capitalism, an end to patriarchy, an end to colonization, an end to racism. And I know we say that, but we are doing it now. This is the process we're in. So I invite you all to continue. Um, we're gonna have another session tomorrow. You can go to our website and see some of the other conversations we've had uh, that are talking about a feminist Green New Deal, that are talking about a lot of other solutions from indigenous leaders. And uh, just know this is um, a marathon we're in. This isn't a sprint. So be with your family, be restored, be with loved ones, don't be alone. We are gonna need each other. And uh, thank you for the beautiful words that you all shared, um, everyone. And um, let, let's keep going. We've got a ways to go. Let's keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Go ahead and open.